Well, good morning. If we could take our Bibles and open them to the book of Romans, chapter 12, and verse 2. Uh, the book of Romans, chapter 12, and verse 2. The uh, title of our message this morning is Mental Renewal. Does anybody out there need some renewal? Well, it starts in the mind, as we're going to see uh, this morning. Of course, we're in a study through the book of Romans. And uh, by this time, we know very well that slide, hopefully, because we've gone through it about 33 times. But Paul wrote the book. He's writing to Roman believers from Corinth about A.D. 57. He's laying a doctrinal foundation in a church that had not been started by an apostle. The book really is about the righteousness of God, how it is acquired, and then once you get it, how do you live it out? It's a very formal letter, as we have discussed We spent about 11 weeks there in Roman numeral 5, a section called Sovereignty. And Romans 9 through 11 dovetailed really nicely with the end of Romans 8. In Romans 8, we have tremendous promises that we have received from God. And yet, those promises mean nothing if God has forgotten his word to Israel. How can God be trusted to be faithful to us if he has been unfaithful to Israel? And now that the faithfulness of God has been vindicated, because we learn in Romans 9 through 11, that Israel's promises are in a state of postponement, not cancellation. One day God is going to make good on what he has promised to Israel. Now that God's character has been vindicated as a promise making, promise-keeping God, as a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God, I can trust everything he has said to me in this book, chapter 8 and elsewhere, and I can come to him now because he is perfectly trustworthy, and I can build my life on his promises. And thus Paul takes us now into the service section of the book. This is not a section on how to become a Christian. It is assuming that the folks reading this are already Christians. It is a section on how to live out the Christian life once you have received it. The strategic word for Paul is in there of chapter 12, verse 1, the word, therefore. A word he used in Ephesians 4.1 a word he used in Galatians 5.1, and a word he is now using in Romans 12, verse 1. And it's a very important word because it transitions us out of doctrine, chapters 1 through 11, into practice. How does doctrine become deed? How does the word that's in us become good works? Of course, the good works don't save us. But God desires, as we learn in this section, to use our lives. How do we serve this Christ that we have come to believe in? That's really what chapter 12, verse 1, through about midway through chapter 15 is about. We can break it down this way. Service within the church, chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Service within society, midway through chapter 12, through the end of chapter 13 and service towards others, chapter 14, verse 1, through about halfway through chapter 15, verse 13. How do I live for God now that I already belong to God? How does this work? Well, the first thing I am to do is I am to consecrate myself to God. Chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Now, last week we got a general description of what it means to consecrate ourselves to God. 
we talked about how we are to deposit ourselves in the presence of God. And we say to the Lord, it's no longer my will, but thy will. Use me as you choose to use me. And as we do that, the Lord looks upon that as a spiritual sacrifice. Not a sacrifice in the sense that we are trying to pay God back. Not a sacrifice in the sense that we are trying to contribute to our salvation. We cannot add a single nickel to our salvation but rather a sacrifice in terms of a worshipful, spiritual aroma that goes up to the Lord. And so that's what we saw yesterday, excuse me, yesterday week, chapter 12, verse 1. And now we come to a second way, and this is the verse we're focusing on this morning, a second way by which we are to consecrate ourselves to the Lord, specifically. And it has to do with something that is to take place in the mind of the Christian. And so notice, if you will, chapter 12 and verse 2. Notice what Paul writes. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. We have here three things that we'll discuss this morning. Number one, a negative exhortation, what not to do. Chapter 12, verse 2, first part of the verse. Number two, a positive exhortation, what we are supposed to do. Second part of verse 2. And then number three, the goal. Once we follow the negative exhortation, what not to do, the positive exhortation, here's what we're supposed to do, what is the end goal? What does the end product look like? So notice, if you will, first of all, the negative exhortation. It's right there at the beginning of verse 2. It says, and do not be conformed to this world. Now, you'll notice there in verse 2 the word world. The word world is the word cosmos in the Greek from which we get the English word cosmopolitan. The world is the system of thought and philosophy energized by Satan. If the Bible is clear on anything, it's this idea that Satan is running the world system. In fact, you might recall in Luke 4, verses 5 through 7, Satan offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. He says, I will give all of this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I can give it to whomever I wish. Jesus didn't say, well, that's not true, Satan, because it is true. Ever since the fall that took place in Eden, Genesis 3, Satan is the source of power and energy behind the world system. He's called the prince of this world, John 12, 31, John 14, 30, John 16, verse 11. He is called the prince and power of the air, Ephesians 2 and verse 2. He is called the god of this age, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. And I've got news for folks. That's not going to change until the events related to the second coming of Christ. It's not until Revelation 11, verse 15, when the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Until that time in history transpires, we are living on enemy territory. Hostile territory. Now, you might ask and ask me this question. Well, I thought Satan was defeated at the cross. John 12, verse 31, indicates that Satan was defeated at the cross. But did you know that in the legal world, there is a difference between a guilt phase of the trial and a penalty phase of the trial? First you are, and we have uh, 
fits very nicely with the message we heard earlier on prison ministry. First, you are convicted of a crime. And then typically what happens is you move into the penalty phase where the judge decides upon and imposes a sentence. They're two different events, typically. Now, Satan has been convicted. That happened at the cross. But the penalty has not yet been imposed. So he is between those two phases. We are living between those two phases. And this is why Satan is as desperate as he is, because he knows he's living on borrowed time. He is a defeated foe, and yet at the same time, he has not been removed from the throne. Very similar, by the way, to Saul on the throne in his latter years. David had already been anointed as the king, 1 Samuel 16. But Saul was still running the country. Saul was actually trying to kill David. And so that, in essence, is the time period that we are in. Saul is on the throne, i.e. Satan. David has been anointed, Jesus Christ. But the authority where Christ returns to the earth and reigns upon David's throne has not yet transpired. And so people in that day made a choice. Are they going to follow David, who's not yet king? Or Saul, who is currently the king. People today have to make that same choice. Are we going to follow Jesus Christ, who is not yet reigning on David's throne? Or are we going to follow Satan, who's currently running the world system? The world system is a system of philosophy which excludes God and alienates our affections from him. This is the system in which we find ourselves. The best description of the world system is in 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, which says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away. And also it's lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. The world system works over time in the mind of the Christian, seeking to alienate us from God, draw us away. Paul, in his very last letter, said this in 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, one of his good Associates in the ministry, he says, For Demas, having loved this world, has deserted me. This is the operation of the world. It's tantalizing, it's arousing, it's appealing, it makes all sorts of promises to us, and it seeks to draw us away from day-by-day fellowship with our God who redeemed us and bought us. You'll notice the word conform there. Do not be conformed. The world seeks to get the believer to think like it thinks or adopt its value system. James, uh, in chapter 1, verse 27, commends certain people. And he says this, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. If you are keeping yourself unstained by the world through the power of God, you are doing really well in your Christian life. But so many Christians are pulled a certain direction. And consequently, their affections from their God are alienated. I I hear it all the time from people. Well, I believe Genesis 1 through 11 is true, but I also believe Darwin, what he said, is true also. And I'm going to mix the two together. So you just took a system of worldly philosophy and mixed it with the Bible. Or you hear a young person talking. Yes, I, I believe all of that stuff about monogamy. But you have to experiment sexually, don't you, before you get married, because you have to determine if you're sexually compatible or not. 
After all, before you buy a car, don't you check under the hood? Such an idea is alien, alien to the scripture. See, what's happened is a philosophy has come in that they picked up somewhere, and they're trying to sort of merge it in with their Christian belief system. Or I hear pastors talking. Yes, I, I believe that it's the Lord that builds his church through the power of the Holy Spirit. But I also need to rely upon marketing and management principles to get this thing to really work. I've got to buy into what a secular guru is saying and sort of mix that with the Bible. So you see what's happened is a worldly philosophy has somehow come in and suddenly we have a religion which is not, as James says, undefiled. Now, you'll notice the word not here. Do not be conformed to this world. Uh, One of the looser translations puts it this way. Do not let the world squeeze you into its mold. The world is working overtime trying to squeeze us into its way of thinking. By the way, notice that this is an active verb. I've got to do something to prevent the world from squeezing me into its mold. I don't have to do anything to come to Christ. I have to trust in Christ. But once I am in Christ, I need to exercise some kind of effort to keep my mind from being suffocated by the world system. Now, how do I do that? Well, I avail myself to the divine resources that I have for the Christian life that we've been learning about in Romans 6. And I appropriate those resources on a moment-by-moment basis. If I will not, as a Christian, take the time to learn of my divine resources and then appropriate them by faith, moment by moment, in just a matter of time, my mind will be conformed to the image of this world system and not the image of the God who bought me with such a great price. These are all instructions for the believer. In fact, if you back up to verse 1, he says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, We are dealing with the present tense of our salvation here, our sanctification. As we have spoken of many times, there are three tenses to our salvation. Justification, the past tense of salvation, for I am freed from the penalty of sin by faith alone in Christ. Sanctification, the present tense of my salvation, for I am gradually being delivered from the power of sin as I avail myself to the divine resources and walk by the power of God moment by moment, and then there will be the future tense of my salvation, where I will be free from the very presence of sin itself when I am outside this body, either at death or the rapture of the church or whichever comes first. Paul is specifically dealing with that middle column, sanctification. And what Paul is showing is that it is possible as a Christian to be pulled back into the world system. I don't think the Christian loses their salvation, but I think their fellowship with God is damaged and their influence and testimony that they could have had for God is damaged as well. This is what broke Paul's heart over this man Demas, who had deserted him, having loved the present world. This is what Paul is warning us against here in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. One of the sort of many controversies that I've had to face in my short time here at the church is a belief in the minds of many people that sanctification is automatic. Many people have a view of the sovereignty of God, which I believe is warped. They believe that once you come to Christ, the sovereignty of God takes over. And the Christian has no danger whatsoever of being pulled back into the world. Can we just ask a simple question on that? Why would Paul tell the brethren or the believer not to be conformed to the world if the Christian being reconformed to the world was not a possibility. The whole command would make no sense, would it? 
I love how the College of Biblical Studies, where I work, phrases this. In the doctrinal statement, it says, Every true believer is promised positional and ultimate sanctification with the possibility of progressive development in life spiritually, progressive sanctification. You see, your justification... The first tense of your salvation is a done deal. Your glorification, the final future tense of your salvation is a done deal. But that middle column there is not a done deal. It's largely up to your response. Will we learn of the divine resources and walk by them moment by moment or will we not? Fascinating to me that Paul in Romans 8, we've pointed this out before when he's articulating the various phases of salvation, foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, glorification, he leapfrogs right over sanctification. Why did he do that? Because unlike the others, sanctification is not a done deal. The others are a done deal. And whether we become sanctified in daily life, whether our practice catches up with our position will determine what kind of influence and ministry we have here on earth and what kind of rewards we will receive in the next life. See, even though you're saved, the choices that we are making as believers have some sort of eternal consequence or ramification. They don't affect your ticket to heaven but they certainly reflect the rewards that you will or will not receive in heaven. If you want a biblical example of people in heaven not receiving rewards, just jot down 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, and read that this week sometime. You'll see it very clearly. So Paul is pleading with us as believers to conform our minds not to the world, but to the thinking of the God who not only created us, but redeemed us. Now, notice, if you will, the second part of verse 2. We move from a negative exhortation, what not to do, now to a positive exhortation. Here's what we're supposed to do. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Notice that word transformed. That word transformed is a change. There needs to be, in God's mind, some sort of change in my life after I come to Christ. That is his desire for me. That is his ambition. Whether it happens or not is largely up to me in terms of my awareness of the divine resources and willing to appropriate them by faith moment by moment. But God's desire is a transformation. In us. Now, how am I transformed? In verse 2, second part of the verse, you'll see the word mind. The battle is for the mind. I can still hear the basketball coaches I had all the way from fifth grade through college. Get your head in the game. It's mental. And you know what? They were right. You will largely go into a game victorious or not victorious, depending on what is happening between the two ears in this arena called the mind. Tim LaHaye's book that he wrote some years back is called The Battle for the Mind. I love that title. Proverbs 23 and verse 7 says, For as he, as a man, thinks within himself, so he is. Numbers 13, verse 33, that generation that came out of Egypt after 400 years and went down to a place called Mount Sinai, there on the Sinai Peninsula. And then they went up to a place called Kadesh Barnea. That generation that had seen the hand of God through the ten plagues, through the parting of the Red Sea, through the revelation of the law. That same generation just has to move 11 days from Sinai to Canaan, and you're in. You've got the land. Deuteronomy 1, verse 2, 11 days journey. 
And yet we know the story. They got to Kadesh Barnea, there on Israel's southern border. They looked into the land, and they saw giants in the land. And they lost the battle in their minds. This is what they said. Numbers 13, verse 33. There also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilim. Watch this. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. They quit looking at life through the divine perspective, and they started looking at their problems through the human perspective, and they forgot the God who brought them out of Egypt through many signs and wonders. And even before a battle was fought, they had lost. They lost it in the mind. We're kind of like that too, aren't we? God brings us to faith. We rejoice over our relationship with Jesus. He performs various miracles in our lives to help us. And that the first sight of trouble, the overdue bill, the mortgage payment that we're not sure we're going to be able to make, the very first sight of trouble, we lose the battle in our minds and we quit trusting God. And we lose before we even go out and fight. See? This is what Paul is saying about the mind. It's very critical what is happening in the mind. That's why there is so much Bible about the mind. Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, if there is any excellence, if anything is worthy of praise, think on these things. Dwell on them. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Ephesians 6 and verse 17 says we are to put on the what of salvation? The helmet. What does the helmet protect? The head. The mind. The flaming darts of the wicked one are aimed at the mind. The 9-11 hijackers did not have to get control of the whole airplane. It was not necessary for them to control every inch of that airplane. They just have to control the place where the airplane is directed by the pilots, the cockpit. And if they control that, they control everything. You see? If Satan has any influence in your life, he wants the arena of the mind. Because if he influences how you think, he can influence you. The battle is for the the mind. In my Christian life, I've discovered that if I give God 90% of my mind and leave 10% over to Satan, he'll be very happy with 10%. He'll be happy with 5%. He'll be happy with 1%. He'll be happy with 50%. Whatever I'm giving up, he'll take. See, there's, there's no neutrality here. I'm either going to think the way God wants me to think, or I am going to let my mind drift back into areas of carnality. And the moment I do that, I've already lost the battle. You'll notice this word, uh, renewed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. My mind has to be renewed. I've got to unlearn old thought patterns. I've got to learn new thought patterns. The great truth of the matter is your mind and our minds have been under the influence of Satan for so long with so many wrong ways of thinking that when you become a Christian, you drag a lot of that mental baggage with you into your Christian experience. If you had a works mentality, that's not going to just disappear overnight just because you're a Christian. You're dragging that into your Christian experience. If you had an anger problem before you came to Christ, that anger problem is going to be dragged into your Christian experience. And it's not until we begin to make progress in this arena of progressive sanctification where we learn to think new things and to undo old thought patterns that those things start to decrease. Anger, works, anxiety... I found that I was a very anxious, worried person before I got saved. And you know what? 
I can be a very anxious, worried person after I'm saved. It all depends upon am I going to trust God or not in a moment of crisis. So this mind has to be renewed. It's the same pattern that God took Israel through. They were in bondage for 400 years. They were liberated through the blood of the Passover lamb. They were brought through the Red Sea. So they're redeemed. They put the blood on the doorpost by faith. And yet look at that crowd coming out of Egypt there. Look at their complaining, grumbling. We want to go back. This is God's redeemed people speaking here. These are the folks that are in the hall of faith, Hebrews 11, because they applied the blood to the doorpost. God now brings them to Sinai to execute a second phase in their salvation called sanctification. You have been thinking the way Pharaoh wants you to think for so long, you don't know how to relate to God. You don't know how to relate to each other. You don't know how to relate to the world. And you don't know how to worship So God then gives them the law, which taught them how to relate to God, commandments 1 through 4, how to relate to each other, commandments 6 through 10, how to relate to the world, your kingdom of priests now, Exodus 19, verses 5 through 8 roughly, and how to worship the tabernacle. They had been doing it the polytheistic way. They had been doing it the Egyptian way. But now that they are redeemed, they had to be reprogrammed. It's like that direction finder in your car. What does it keep saying when you're lost? I get lost a lot. It says recalibrating over and over again. Does that happen to you guys? Recalibrating, recalibrating. See, that's what's going on in your mind. Your mind is being recalibrated. It has to think the way God wants it to to think. How is our mind renewed? I don't know of a way to do it other than the scripture. John 17:17, 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. Joshua 1:8. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. You've got to think about it. You've got to let it into your mind. You've got to start to obey it so that you may be careful to do all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Do you want success in the spiritual life? Of course, I'm not defining success the way it's done on Christian, so-called Christian television. I am defining success in terms of living the way God wants you to live, having the sphere of influence that he wants you to have. Then the word of God has to be a critical part of our intake. The mind independent of the word of God will not be Renewed. It will just keep thinking the way it's always thought. And you're blood bought and you're going to heaven, but the mind is not conformed and so you're neutralized in the Christian life. Coming to church will renew the mind. Hebrews 10.25, do not forsake your own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Coming to a church like this where we teach the Bible at all different levels. From the pulpit, Sunday school classes, midweek. That will help conform the mind. Hanging out with the right people will conform the mind. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 16 says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. 
entering into close relationships and friendships with those that are unsaved will make it difficult for your mind to be conformed and transformed. Certainly we need to be in the world, but not of the world. I need to be in the world to share the gospel, as Gary Richards is doing. But I need to be removed from the world in the sense that I do not get so close to the world that suddenly I begin to think the way the world wants me to think. I even believe that you should be very careful about relationships even with fellow believers. Because you can be on the different pages maturity-wise. And if I were to stand up on a chair, it is far easier for you to pull me off the chair than for me to pull you up. Read the story of Lot and you'll see it very clearly. A very good sermon title is, Are You a Lot Like Lot? Who sort of uh, pitched his tent towards Sodom. By the way, Lot is called a righteous man three times in 2 Peter 2, verses 7 and 8. He's positionally righteous. He's a believer in the Old Testament sense of the word. But the mind is drifting towards the world. He's pitching his tent towards Sodom. Genesis 13, he is sitting at the gates in Sodom. Genesis 19, he is offering his daughters to the Sodomites. Genesis 19. In fact, when the destroying angel comes and says, get out of here because I'm going to destroy this place called Sodom, Lot begins to articulate a spiritual truth to his in-laws, and the man had lost so much credibility that they thought he was joking. This is a man that Peter calls righteous three times. His practice had not caught up with his position, and he bore a tremendous consequence because of it. The story of Lot ends with him in a drunken state and in this incestuous relationship with his two daughters. And from those unholy unions come forth the Moabites and the Ammonites, perennial enemies of Israel. There is a price or a consequence associated with not living the sanctified life. The very thing that Paul is urging us to do here. We have a Negative command, do not be conformed to the world. We have a positive command, but be transformed in the renewing of our minds. We do that through an intake of Scripture. We do that through coming to church regularly. We do that by seeking out the right relationships. God will give you the right relationships, I believe, if you're open to Him. One of the great pearls of wisdom... That my dad, it's amazing how smart parents get the older we get. When we're teenagers, we don't think they know anything. But suddenly they become very bright, don't they? One of the great pearls of wisdom my dad gave me is he said, don't let your friends pick you. You pick your friends. Be careful who you're affiliating with. Be careful who you are associating with. And, of course, the Scripture is filled with those types of admonitions all over the book of Proverbs, many verses we could quote. So we learn what not to do. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. We learn what we are supposed to do. Our minds are to be renewed. Let's look finally, by way of closing, in the third part of this. What's the goal? What's going to happen if my mind is renewed? What's going to happen if I begin to walk out the principles of the spiritual life? What is the end product? And notice, if you will, the third part of verse 2. So that you may prove... What the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. What's the goal? The goal is, you'll notice this word prove, the goal is discernment. When the mind is renewed, it has a capacity to discern the will of God. I believe in context, Paul is speaking of the general will of God for all believers. 
Should I wear a blue tie or a different color tie this morning? I pray to the Lord. He gives me an answer. Put the blue one on. I don't think that's really what he's talking about. By the way, I just asked my wife what time I'm supposed to put on. and it solves that problem. It's not talking about that type of specific will. It's talking more about the general will that all believers are to follow. Psalm 119, verses 105. An Amy Grant song, and I will not sing it for you. Your word is a what? Lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Have you ever... Tried stumbling around the house without adequate lighting? Have you ever gone hiking and it gets dark and you forgot your flashlight? How impossible it is to maneuver or to get from destination A to destination B? How dangerous that is because you could twist an ankle, you could get hurt, you could fall over something. And yet the light comes on and you can see. You can see the areas of danger. You can see the goal where you should be heading you can see the path and so the lamp or the light serves as a guide by which we can navigate so in the same way if my mind is illuminated with the truth of God's word suddenly choices are coming up in my life and I can see which choice is good and which choice I should stay away from Did I get more intelligent? No. The word of God is that lamp or that light showing me the way Should I max out my credit cards this Christmas? Last Christmas? Maybe it's too late for last Christmas. Well, maybe not. Proverbs 22, verse 7 says, The borrower is the slave to the lender. What about this grudge that I've been holding all these years because somebody in the past has injured me? And by the way, everybody in this life gets injured by somebody. We're living in a fallen world. Everybody has a reason to hold a grudge against somebody for something. A teacher, a one-time friend, a parent, an unkind remark aimed at you, a boss, whatever the case is, if you're holding a grudge against somebody or hurt by somebody, you are completely normal. But do I just sit there and let it fester in a state of unforgiveness where I think about it and ruminate about it constantly? Or do I let that person go? Do I let that person off the hook? Maybe I ought to do the latter. Because Ephesians 4 verse 27 says, Do not let the sun go down on your anger, lest you give Satan a foothold. Should I take a job? that is going to increase my workload an additional 20 hours a week, even though the benefits are better, the pay is better, it's just going to increase my workload and I will be outside of the home for a longer period of time. Should I take that job or not? Well, I have Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7, which says I am to teach spiritual principles to my children. In fact, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7 says that we should role model spiritual principles to our children. You shall teach them diligently to your sons. You shall talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. So as I am in the home, not necessarily lecturing, but role modeling spiritual principles For my children, there is a transfer taking place. Conversations will come up naturally in the course of the day about spiritual things. And thus it is the divine pattern that parents role model these truths for their children. That's how the learning process happens. But I have this opportunity in my terms of my career to be outside the home more often. What should I do? Well, maybe Deuteronomy 6 verse 7 might help me with that. You see, and this is how the Bible works. The more familiar we become with the principles of God's word, the more we can make informed, godly, spiritual choices. But if I will not take time to meditate upon this book, if I will not attend a church that teaches this book, I am basically stumbling around in the dark without a flashlight. 
My mind has not been renewed. It is still thinking the old way, and I'm making poor choice after poor choice after poor choice as a consequence. I am not experiencing God's best. But when I see the world the way God sees it, I can make tremendous choices that to the world probably make no sense at all. But they're a big deal in terms of what's happening in your home, what's happening in your spiritual life, what's happening in terms of your relationship to God. Notice the description of this will of God. Notice the adjectives that are used. It's good. It's acceptable. And it's perfect. So the great challenge that we face as those who have experienced salvation and have understood all of these doctrines that Paul has unfolded to us is our practical sanctification, our daily walk with God. How do I live this thing out once I have it? I'm certainly not living it out to pay God back. Can't do that. I'm certainly not living it out to contribute something to my salvation. It's not a scenario where God buys lunch and I throw in the tip. Jesus said to Telestai, paid in full. But out of an act of worship, a heartfelt response to what God has done, I should, by way of worship, consecrate myself to him. I do that, verse 1, by offering my body as a living sacrifice. And I do it, verse 2, by allowing my mind to be changed. A negative command, I no longer think the way the world thinks. A positive command, my mind is being renewed through the scripture. And now the goal of life is achieved where I can discern the will of God in many areas and make proper choices accordingly. May God help us as a church and as a group to live for him as we live out the principles of practical sanctification. Next week we take it to a new level where we begin to talk about service within the church through something Paul wants us to know about called the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Father, we uh, remain thankful for what you have done for us and all of us, Lord, uh, confess that we have not thought the way you want us to think in many, many areas. Make us people, Lord, not of a partial transformation, but a complete transformation through mental renewal as we grow and develop into the people that you would have us to become. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. And God's people said. Of course, it's possible that somebody could be here uh, with us. And that person does not know Jesus Christ in a personal way. If that is your circumstance, then may I just say to you that you have no ability whatsoever to overcome the world. 1 John 4.4 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It's not until Jesus Christ comes into us that we have the ability to overcome the world and its patterns. For those of us in faith, we just have to discover what God has given us and live by it. But if you're not in faith, you don't even have the power to overcome the world. You're under the domain of darkness. You have... No resources by which to resist the allurements of the world system. You simply exist to do Satan's bidding. And how all of that can change right now. By simply trusting in the provision of Jesus Christ. Becoming a Christian is not an eight-step process. It's a one-step process. It is to believe or to trust in the provision of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ stepped out of eternity into time to absorb the wrath of God the Father in our place. He resurrected from the grave, 
consequently validating who he was. And if I will simply believe in what he has promised, that he is who he says he is, and he will give me the gift of life, and my sin debts are forgiven, and I can have the hope of eternity, if I will simply trust in those things, then I become a Christian. And once I become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes into me. Jesus Christ himself starts living in me. And suddenly this power to resist the world is there that I didn't have before. And so becoming a Christian is something you can do right now in the quietness of your own thoughts, in the quietness of your own heart, as the Holy Spirit is convicting you of the sin of unbelief. Simply respond to the gospel. Trust in it and it alone for your eternity. Abandon whatever construct you were trusting in, whether it be yourself, your religion. Trust exclusively in the promises of Jesus Christ and on the authority of the Word of God. You are a saved person. If that's something uh, you wish to learn more about, I'm available after the service to assist you with that. But really, what it comes down to is it's between you and the Lord. Nobody can make the choice for you. If we could, we would have done it a long time ago. It's not a matter of raising your hand, walking an aisle, filling out a card. It's a matter of you and the Lord trusting in Him and Him alone. Do that today. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Greet someone you don't know. I see several people that are new here. Greet someone you don't know on the way out. God bless you. You're dismissed.